welcome everyone. We're very happy to see <clears throat> everyone here. I know this um, presentation generated quite a bit of interest and I'm sure it will not disappoint. Sorry, Tim, no pressure. But <laughs> um, we're looking forward very much to hearing uh, from Tim. And thanks again to Alan, our Director of Professional Development and Training, who you know, continues to deliver on these um, development workshops monthly. Over to you, Alan. Well, thank you, Valerie. <clears throat> and welcome everybody to uh, our June webinar. And um, I'm delighted to have Tim McQuillan, um, a colleague of mine and also Valerie's from the Atlanta Area Evaluation Association. Um, Tim and I have been um, looking at ways in which um, data can be used in the international development field. Um, and so I know that's uh, going to be of relevance to many people here. Um, I also think what uh, I've had a sneak preview of what Tim is going to say, and I think it's a good um, starting point or platform for a series of conversations uh, that we're going to host over the summer and early fall autumn um, about the Evolve for Action uh, decade of evaluation um, for development. Um, so without any further ado, I think Tim has a slide which is going to outline the aims of the um, webinar today. And um, I just know that everyone's very pleased to have Tim with us. So welcome, Tim, and we look forward to what you have to tell us. Thank you, and thanks everybody for, for attending. And thanks for the CEI to, for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody. Um, I'm going to actually stop my video if no one cares that uh, I think most everyone else is. And just from a bandwidth perspective, probably the best uh, thing to do. So hopefully everybody looking at my slides instead of me anyway. So um, I think as it said in the uh, introduction or the, the advertisement for the webinar. So the main aim is to just do an introduction really um, around the different types of data and their role in evaluation, um, how the evaluators can, can work with different stakeholders, project managers, practitioners, and other folks um, to improve the project performance, and then also how different stakeholders in a project can maybe co collaborate and adapt and learn, and the evaluator's role, like how an evaluator can help them be successful and be successful themselves. So that's sort of uh, in general what we we're going to cover. Um, as I said, it's it's going to be sort of a um, a broader uh, introduction to these ideas. It's not going to be a deep dive, although there's, I feel like, a lot of information on the slides. Um, we're just going to kind of touch on on it at a fairly high level. Um, and, and hopefully when we get into the discussion part, we'll dig into it a little bit deeper, but um, that's sort of how we're gonna approach it. Um, let me advance my slide here for some reason. There we go. So just a little bit about myself. Um, so basically, uh, long and short is, I came into international development fairly early in my career um, as a MBA Enterprise Corps. A volunteer consultant, which was basically like uh, a Peace Corps volunteer for MBA graduates. So they would send us over to different countries to um, help, in that case, back in the 90s, late 90s, uh, former Soviet enterprises become more uh, kind of capitalist type countries and companies. So um, I was sent over there. I ended up living and working in Ukraine for eight years, um, mainly with private sector companies. And that's where most of my uh, experience has been up until the last year or so when I decided to turn back towards international development um, because I saw a real opportunity uh, and a need for a better understanding of, of data and a broader understanding of how data can, can help international programs. And that's really, as the, my mission statement kind of says, is to help um, these organizations and businesses better understand, improve, uh, and improve and improve their impact and make better decisions. Because it's not just about from an evaluation perspective, you know, coming in at the end uh, and saying, yeah, you did this right, you did, didn't do that right, uh, you hit this mark and this result, or you didn't hit that other one. It's really about helping along the way um, and making the impact better. And that should be what everybody's goal is, whether it's the M&E folks 
or the the uh, program uh, implementers. So so again, I won't go into too much, but my background anymore. Um, but in terms of what I what I kind of bring to the market, I hope is you know some Mel advisory services and support, whether it's helping design those kinds of uh, plans or help implement them. Um, a broader data analytics strategy, which we're gonna see a little bit today. And then basically any kind of program technical assistance, you know, whether it's with private sector companies or social enterprises, things like that. So that's a little bit about me. Oh, and I invite everybody after this, uh, after this webinar to please connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I don't know if we're gonna send out the deck or not afterwards, but there is a link in the deck. Um, in here, but uh, you've got my name, so just look me up in LinkedIn. I'd love to connect with everybody afterwards. So that's it about me. Okay, so just to kind of dive right in, um, as I said, this is um, kind of a, a broader perspective on data and analytics and, and how it gets transformed into decisions and impacts. So, um, I think the best way to kind of read this is to really start from the right and go backwards uh, or to the left. So in any kind of data transformation, I mean, this is really like a value chain, right? You're going from the data sources, the raw data to um, transforming all of that into uh, information and insights that can drive these better decisions and ultimately better impact. So, um, that, so that's really kind of the point of this whole slide. You know, the, the takeaway is um, start with the end in mind. Everything should be driven. You shouldn't be starting with, okay, these are the data sources that I have available. Um, what can I, you know, what can I ask or what can I query from them and get? It's what are our objectives? What's the strategy? What are the insights that we need to drive these decisions and impact? And then design everything else backwards based on that. So as you can see, you know, I kind of broke this up sort of with the colors to give you a sense of the three main uh, progressions, I guess, through the, through the different transformation processes. So um, again, starting on the right, the green part is primarily, you know, around the use, what's driving it. I would call these the, the data analytics drivers, because um, again, they're driving everything that, that is going to be put together from the data perspective. Um, and then the blue and the orange, I would call uh, the data uh, enablers. So these are what enable us to get the information and the insights that we need to, to affect the, the decisions and the impact. So now that we know that, um, I'll go to back to the left and start going through the left, uh, from left to right. So as we can see, I mean, it all starts with what kind of data uh, we're gonna be generating, right, based on our objectives. So the sources, as you can see below, it can come from a myriad of different places. I mean, it's not just typically, um, like we might typically think is beneficiaries and things like that. It, it can be from uh, donors and investors. And when I say investors, like impact investors, which are becoming more and more prevalent um, in our industry. Um, the partners who are gonna be implementing the, uh, the programs, your internal team, whether it's in headquarters or in the field, um, you need information from them. Um, government statistics, you know, third party, second party um, actors that you can get data from, and then just other public data. There's there's data, there's any kind of data you can imagine out there. Um, so so there's that many sources. You can collect it in a variety of ways. Again, it's not just typically say surveys um, like we tend to think of or interviews and focus groups but there's um, you know how, how you get that could be in person obviously digital surveys there's a lot of mobile surveys now um, tablets things like that being used direct observation obviously um, where it's not even you know you're asking questions or have a questionnaire but you know you could be just you know making notes you know of what you observe um, there's internal documents and by that i mean all the information and all the reports um, that have been stored in say word documents or sitting on somebody's shelf on a piece of paper um, inside the organization itself and, it, and there's really a lot of i think 
probably uh, unused information and insights locked in there. And I know a lot of the, not a lot, but there's a, there's a good number of organizations that are trying to actually mine that data itself um, because it's dispersed everywhere and get insights out of that. Um, there's imagery data by that. I mean, like satellite imagery, you've probably all heard examples of that, you know, being able to um, track, you know, weather or migration patterns or things through through satellite imagery, sensors, uh, and even just anecdotes where you're just talking with folks and, uh, you know, telling telling a short story, you know, because the short stories can have as much impact as, as um, or much as much information as just, you know, kind of quantitative data. So myriad of sources, lots of different ways to collect that data from those sources. The blue part, the processing storage and analysis, that is um, sort of the technical part of it, which, um, you know, we're not to obviously get into too much detail on that because a lot of it's the ICT folks that, that need to be involved with this and, and know the most. But, you know, data needs to be transformed from when you collect it um, into a format that you can actually analyze it because it doesn't always come in that way ready. And that's what we call these ETL processes, extract, transform, and load into, into your on into your uh, IT systems. So that could be, you know, there's decisions that need to be made on that um, by your, the organizations, you know, they could have it on a cloud, um, they could have it on premise in their own uh, organization. You gotta have the databases set up in a way that they're accessible and that they can be combined to yield more insights. There's um, analytical software, there's specific software programs that say if you've got a data scientist on staff or even just a data analyst um, that they like to use. So, you know, every organization has its own suite of software for analysis and for visual visualization. So you're probably aware of, you know, like Power BI and Tableau and things like that, which are being increasingly used. Um, and then IT security and, um, the security systems that basically protect the data. Um, and that's kind of a, a lead into the, what I wanted to mention about data governance, because um, as you see, it spans this whole uh, transformation process. And it's something that doesn't really get, I guess, talked about a lot, um, but it's actually very important and becoming more important, um, especially on the uh, data privacy and security side, um, you know, with healthcare data being collected, um, there's especially, you know, when you're dealing in certain countries, there's a risk of if that information gets out, I mean, it could actually be used to harm people. Um, there's also sort of a, uh, you know, ethics issues that get involved where you, you want to have policies, processes, and technology that allows you to um, account for, you know, basically the doing good ethical practices with the data. Um, so that's sort of the privacy and security side, but then governance also refers to um, the data itself, like the quality of it and the integrity. And the difference between quality and integrity is quality is just, um, is it, did we collect it the right way? And is it representing the, the actual views or the actual situation that we're trying to measure? And the integrity part of it is, is there consistency among the different sources? Um, so that when I look at one metric um, or indicator, um, you know, in this context, and I see the same one in another context, are they the same or do they mean something different? So there, again, there's processes and policies and things that need to be in place from a government perspective or a governance perspective to ensure all that. Um, and then finally, you know, obviously there's there's lots of decisions and impacts. Um, that all this is being being collected for and processed for, um, but you want to take into account obviously what the impact goals are, who the decision makers are, basically the users um, who are going to be using the data, and what exactly they need. You know what are their information needs, um, and then the timeliness of it because you know not all information is going to be needed at the same time. So um, basically the. The, the summary of it is to get the right data, or sorry, the right information to the right people at the right time. So if you had to boil down all the decisions and impacts, that's that's kind of the way you'd, you'd summarize it. So I know that's a lot to throw at everybody in, in one slide, on the first slide even, but um, again, I just wanted to kind of give you sort of a broad perspective of um, what all goes into actually collecting data and turning it into insights and and decision support information because um, there's a lot of stuff that goes into and you know 
M and E folks, you know, we're not going to have a lot of control over some of this stuff. But the more we understand this and can explain it to people, um, you know, the, the better they can design programs um, and and have better impact. So, move on. Oops, did I skip one? Nope. Okay, so this I believe, if anyone attended, I think one of your previous webinars in January, I think it was, um, you guys saw this slide. And this is just really a setup for the next slide where um, the summative evaluation storytelling perspective is um, kind of the typical way everybody thinks about it, right? It's, it's like a log frame describing what happened, you know, and you look at resources, inputs, outputs, and outcomes, and then you know, measure basically how well those those resources and inputs performed, um, how effective were the output outputs and outcomes, and then you know you can add a cost effective aspect to it. So it's very linear um, and very kind of backward looking. So what this next slide uh, I want to show is kind of again broadening the perspective of of what data can actually do. So we can actually answer more than just um, kind of what happened or looking back in the past uh, about, about um, you know, impact and, and performance. So um, to the left, this visual is kind of basically, it's got, you know, an axis, two axes, um, one on value, one on complexity. So obviously the, the more value uh, that you want to extract from the data, uh, the more complex it is and the more complex analytical tools and, and um, methods you need to use. So, but if we go kind of from the, the simplest at the top with descriptive down to the prescriptive, um, descriptive is pretty simple. It's kind of what most people do, you know, what's happening or has happened in my program. So the important thing in there is, you know, having good visualization and having, you know, the data that you need. So that's the, that's the basics, right? And it's just simple calculations, right? Percentages, um, you know, growth rates, you know, changes and things like that. Um, so, but the next layer up is in value is the diagnostic, where you start to ask the data, why is this happening? Um, and here, you know, a lot of it, I'm sure a lot of you do this too already, just, you know, we'll call it human learning through human analysis, um, that you don't, uh, use necessarily sophisticated uh, mathematical techniques, but you're just looking at the data and based on your experience and your knowledge and, um, um, you know, common sense, you can explain looking at the descriptive data what why something actually happened. So you try to drill down into explaining what caused it to happen so you can hopefully project that onto the future and either avoid it uh, the next time or do it, keep doing it and do it again um, the next time. So the next layer up in, in value and complexity is the predictive. This is to try to guess what likely, what's likely to happen. So the most, I guess, easiest typical example to give would be like forecasts, you know, forecasting of um, staff, of spending needs, things like that. And so, you know, there's tools, simple tools in Excel, things like that, that you can use to, to estimate things that might happen. But there's also a more sophisticated way of, of doing it um, with regression analyses to um, predict, you use more predictors and actually be able to do like scenario planning to say, well, what if this happens or what if that happens, how much will it be affected and, and sort of play with those kinds of numbers. So um, you know, this starts to get into more sophisticated analyses where, you know, you've probably heard of data scientists and people like that, where you start to pull in data scientists to begin to, to write these algorithms to, to, um, to do these predictive models. And then finally, so, so basically the first three there, um, are all inputs for decision-making, but it, it leaves entirely the actual decision up to uh, the person, right, the human. When you get into prescriptive, you start to cross over that, that line to actually kind of giving recommendations, like what do I need to do? And so a simple example from the real world, I guess, or the, the non-international development world would be like Netflix recommendations. You know, think, think of that. So that there's, you know, you're using predictive analysis 
um, but you're also taking it a step further to say, okay, if, if it's predicting this, then what should I do about it to either continue with it or, um, or avoid it? And one, um, one way in international development, I think this is being used, and I think actually Allen's uh, Get the Data team uh, has done this before, like with risk assessments, right? If there's a risk of, um, I think, like a reoffender in a particular program, um, say he'd get a predictive risk score, he or she, you know, say it's a 35 or whatever. So if it's a 35 risk score, then you'd have other things that say, okay, because he's a 35 risk score, um, you should do this and this and this to help um, uh, lessen or you know, reduce his score so that he's less of a risk. You know, what kind of interventions can you do to reduce the, the risk of this person reoffending? So, so hopefully that's clear. I mean, that's just sort of the progression of the different ways that the data can be used. So it's really not just about looking back, doing a quick analysis of, you know, what was the percent change, what's the volume of participants, things like that, to where you can actually start to become a, a decision support tool and a decision to, to support resource for people, as opposed to just sort of looking back after the fact um, and, and telling them what happened, you can actually say, you know, this is what might happen uh, and this is what I suggest that you do, okay? So now we're kind of um, jumping into the adaptive management cycle. And so this actually, um, evolved, I believe, from a recognition of the complexity and the unpredictability of program environments that everybody's working in. And I think everybody, I think are talking with Valerie about this just before the, the webinar, that um, everybody's kind of, everybody knows it's a very complex environment that international development works in, right? Things um, don't always go as planned. Things, uh, you know, you, you can't predict a lot of things that are going to happen. And so, you can't just, you know, create your log frame, create your theory of change, and sort of, you know, treat it as the Bible that, uh, you know, it's, it shouldn't change, uh, and you need to stick to that no matter what. So, um, so this kind of uh, framework, I think, was was kind of born out of the idea that they're they're recognizing that that you need to adapt. You got to recognize that things might change throughout the process. Um, and so what I guess we just wanted to, to emphasize here was, you know, the m and &E professional evaluators, you can play a role in any one of these phases, plan, do, or evaluate and respond. We don't have to just wait until things are done and handed to us and say, you know, measure this. Um, we can actually add value through all parts of this process. We can help. And, and again, it's, it's not that we're necessarily experts in a particular sector or a particular technical area or something like that, but we can help those people, um, you know, think, think about how to measure things in this environment from the beginning so that, um, you know, again, they can have a more effective program and, and a more impactful program. Um, so, uh, so this is just, yeah, the introduction to this sort of concept of, of the adaptive management cycle. And the next slide is basically um, USAID's answer to the adaptive management cycle, because they recognize this. And this, um, I think in the form of like, uh, I think it's called complexity aware monitoring, um, which has been, you know, emphasized a lot by, by USAID um, is, the framework they've built to sort of build this into their missions. So the idea is, you know, if they can incorporate uh, this collaboration learning adapting um, tools and processes and sort of learning culture into the missions, that it'll help them better in their planning and, and effectiveness. So, um, you know, and, and again, you can see on the left side there, it's results focused. And that's the other thing is, you know, USAID is getting increasingly focused on results. It's not just what are the outputs, 
um, of particular interventions or activities, it's, you know, outcomes, you know, so which actually makes sense because, and it's probably better because it does leave some flexibility in the programs where you're not tied to um, the exact, like I said, the exact log frame, the exact activities, the exact even theory of change is that if it's the results that, that are um, the important thing, then, <clears throat> then you should focus on how, how do we best achieve the results rather than how do we stick to the plan basically. Um, so, um, so yeah, so the, so again, this is their framework, uh, adapting to the, the adaptive management cycle. The next few slides, uh, just wanted to kind of go through some ideas, um, how evaluators might add value in each one of these, uh, collaborating, learning and adapting processes. Okay. So first collaborating. <clears throat> so this definition of collaborating is, is really right from USAID. So this is how they view it. It's the process of strategically identifying key internal and external stakeholders, and deciding how best to work with them in order to add value, fill gaps, and avoid duplication while working towards a shared goal. So it makes sense. Um, and so, you know, how evaluators can help uh, in this area successfully, they can do it by one, understanding the shareholder, or sorry, the stakeholders, um, making sure that, you know, identifying who the, who the um, most important ones are, uh, who might have the most influence, um, what are the desired results of each one, um, and then what their role is in, in of course, the, the whole implementation plan. And, there, and actually USAID has built a bunch of tools for this. Um, they have like sh stakeholder mapping tools. That, um, and again, this is for um, the missions themselves. So this is not necessarily for, for M&E folks to be doing. Um, but again, the more that uh, M&E folks can understand what it is, you know, how, how they're measuring these things and, and who these people are, the better off, you know, the more effective that we can be. Um, another way to be successful in collaborating is trying to get the uh, stakeholders to focus on material outcomes. And so, um, as probably a lot of you guys have experienced, you know, they don't, some people want to measure everything and, you know, that's really not the, probably the best use of resources. So they, re you really want to, as much as you can, um, get them to think about what's material, what's the most important ones. You know, you can have, I guess, other lower priority indicators um, just in case, because again, you may have to adapt and maybe the ones that were low priority to begin with become high priority because something has changed. But um, in, the, in the beginning, you know, you definitely want to have a prioritized set of outcomes and indicators. Um, so um, clarifying what gets measured and how, this kind of relates to, to the uh, material outcomes, but it gets more into um, the actual indicators themselves, like making sure the indicators actually are good measures of those outcomes and, and get to what the uh, stakeholders really want to get to. Um, and then how, you know, what's the best way? Is the best way to, to get third-party data? Is the best way to do a survey? Is the best way to do a focus group? Um, that's again, where it's how, uh, evaluators can, can provide some input. Um, another way obviously for, for collaboration, uh, to be successful is encouraging discussion about unintended outcomes. So again, you know, log frames put together, theory of change put together, it's all focused on intended outcomes, you know, what we want to accomplish, but um, again, in this complex env these complex environments that we all work in, um, you know, there can be also unintended consequences. So to kind of think through those as much as possible is also important because you may end up uh, doing more harm than good in some cases. You know, even though you hit your your intended outcome, you may have created an unintended outcome that uh, that may, may be even worse than than it was before. So. Um, getting people to, again, to kind of broaden their thought about it 
um, and having some ideas about how to measure those, um, I think is important. And then finally for collaboration, you know, there are probably are gonna be times where the stakeholders don't agree on things, right? They may have a different idea of even what the problem is, how to define the problem, or they may just have a difference in um, how to address the problem and how best to, to solve it. So what a evaluator can do is help provide evidence, you know, things that were done, papers that were written about other examples, um, but also just your own experience about, you know, working with other projects and, and research that you've done and things like that, that you can bring to the table to, to basically, and, and again, it's all fact-based. fact, fact based. You know, If you've got data or can bring data, even better, because that could sometimes break the tie or, or you know, bring people to consensus uh, if they can all agree with, with numbers. And not everybody agrees with numbers, obviously. There's, there's you know, certain numbers that, uh, that people will agree with and certain numbers that they won't um, because we all know about statistics. But you know, the best that an evaluator can do is bring um, the most objective numbers they can to, to help kind of break ties and, and break through perspectives that may not be fact-based. Okay, so that's collaboration. Um, the learning part of it. So again, the USAID um, definition of learning is the intentional process of generating, capturing, sharing, and analyzing information and knowledge from a wide range of sources to inform decisions and adapt programs to be more effective. So that's kind of the heart of everything, right? And that's where obviously um, evaluators get involved a lot. So, but you know, again, USAID is trying to create this learning culture um, where it's to have the team be most effective, first of all, so that they work together most effectively. Then also, you know, having this sort of open, open environment where people aren't afraid to fail. Um, because they can you know, learn from their past mistakes, they can admit their mistakes and um, utilize that information to, to do better the next time. So you know, the same can be said for evaluators. And, and I would call sort of you know, our role as, as being a trusted advisor and trusted because you know, we're dependable. If we say we're gonna do something, we do it. You know, a very basic piece of professionalism. Um, be organized, you know, know what we're talking about. Um, be non-judgmental because um, there's also folks, you know, I've, I've run into a lot of sort of math folks that, you know, they do believe that, that math is God and math is ultimate truth. And in some cases they're right, but in some cases they're wrong. And in some cases people, even if they are right, they can't communicate that to people um, and sort of feel like, well, why don't you understand this? You know, it's simple math. <laughs> so, um, uh, so not to be judgmental about people who maybe don't understand the math, um, which is fine, but it's, uh, it's incumbent on evaluators and data science people in particular to be able to translate that, um, that math, that analytics into things that people can understand. And if they can't understand it, to me, that's, that's on us, not on them. Um, it's, it's who's trying to communicate the point. So... And then finally, just to be, you know, be humble enough to, to admit mistakes. You know, everybody makes mistakes. Um, we try to minimize them. But again, in, in the atmosphere of a learning culture, um, you want other people to be able to admit their mistakes to you. So you need to be able to admit uh, your mistakes to them. Um, second, I'd say, you know, advocate for digital data collection. And if you can't do that, if it's still sort of manually on paper, things like that, um, get it digitized somehow. Um, whenever possible. Like I know, you know, collecting data in a digital format, like through mobile phones or, or, you know, computers or anything like that, you know, sometimes internet isn't available or it's just not possible. So in that case, you just got to work around it. But, you know, any data can be digitized. I mean, you probably already know there's stuff like, you know, OCR and natural language processing, things like that, where you could take a, a piece of paper, scan it, just like you make a PDF, and then that essentially digitizes it. And there's computer programs and, and software that can extract information from those documents and put them into a database. So there's really, apart from maybe budget or just you know, lack of understanding of it, um, there's really no excuse not to digitize data these days. 
So, um, you know, knowing as much about that as you can and advocating for it is, uh, is really important, I think, for, for the future of, of evaluation and, and, and data science in general in, in international development. And so, and I say even for qualitative data because, you know, I think some, some uh, organizations think that, okay, if it's like, you know, an interview, it's like exploratory um, research, um, like I'm asking, you know, why questions and how questions and things like that. That's not like ratings and Likert scales and things like that, that I can't quantify it. You know, it can't be quantified. Therefore, I don't really need to digitize it. I just need to summarize it or something in my own head. But again, there's techniques um, that, you know, you can code this qualitative data to make it quantifiable for analysis. So, you know, don't, don't accept the, if someone says, well, you know, it's just, it's certain, or, um, you know, interview data, it's long form, you know, long answers and things. You don't accept that answer as, you know, so we can't measure it. You can measure that kind of stuff. Um, another way to support a learning culture is um, sort of expanding the team's perspective. It's kind of like with data analytics, right? There's stuff that, um, you know, we don't know, obviously, but there's, um, stuff they don't know as well. And so they may not just realize that, hey, there's people trying things like machine learning or AI or something in these other markets to solve these problems. Um, or they may not, they may know about a little bit, but it wasn't successful, but there maybe have been new approaches that have been tried um, using data analytics and machine learning um, that, that could be helpful. So keeping up with sort of the latest on what's going on in, in international development and these approaches, definitely is going to help um, support the learning culture. Sorry, I'm still admitting people. Um, so finally, um, just ask informed measurement related questions, I think helps um, the process. You know, when people are talking or coming up with their theories of change um, or their log frames or whatever, you know, obviously start thinking in our heads, how, how are you going to measure that? Or what do you really mean? Because, you know, it could be written in a way, without that kind of input, it could be written in a way that's really not measurable um, quantitatively or even qualitatively because it's not clear enough. Because everything has to be obviously translated in, into, all the outcomes have to be translated into to indicators and, and calculations, right? So just asking those kind of measurement questions um, is important. And then especially how, you know, do we have the data? And if we don't have the data, how are we going to get the data? Because, you know, that the data may not be available and it may not be um, accessible, period, um, especially if you're trying new things. Um, no one may have tried it before. Um, so, you know, even if you can't, just the fact of knowing that it's not going to be measurable is helpful because you don't want to get um, all the way again at the end or halfway through the project and suddenly realize when it's time to, to report results that we can't get the data. But if it was known ahead of time, at least we can set expectations up front that says, look, this is going to be very difficult, you know, or the data that we're going to get, you know, it's going to be measuring this, which is not exactly what you're looking for, but it might be a good enough proxy. Um, you know, setting that kind of expectation early on in the process is only going to help us uh, as evaluators and only going to help the, the practitioners who are, you know, need to report those results up the chain to folks and to other stakeholders. Um, and then, you know, obviously it's going to be a dialogue. So not only just us asking the questions to them, but encouraging them to ask from us because, you know, get them to thinking in measurement related terms as well. So that when they're thinking about their outcomes and, and whatnot, uh, the impacts, um, that they're actually starting to think themselves about what are, what are the questions and what are the measurement implications. Okay, I th this is my last slide coming up. I know I think we're at 245, right? Um, okay, so last one is adapting. Adapting is an intentional approach to reflect um, on for reflecting on learning and making decisions and iterative adjustments in response to new information and changes in context. Again, recognizing complexity and how do we um, adapt to that complexity. So the best way that, that you can help clients and ourselves um, to adapt is by one, familiarizing ourselves with complexity where monitoring concepts and use cases. And um, I'm actually just starting to learn about this myself uh, in more depth. 
Um, but again, it's, it's not necessarily rocket science, but it does, you know, being complexity aware, there is a complexity that you need to understand the different facets of it at what levels in society, um, whether it's individual complexity or societal complexity or, you know, country level um, complexity. Um, we just need to be aware of, of how that all fits into the monitoring concepts. Um, building local capacity. So, um, you know, local, the local folks are going to be, in my view, able to be much more adaptable than say we will be sitting in the states or sitting in our home countries. Um, and it also goes into um, sustainability, right? Um, and like for example, USAID, you know, they talk about wanting to get out of the business of, of aid eventually. So basically they want to put themselves out of business. And so they're emphasizing building in local capacity using local partners whenever possible for different things. Um, so probably in, in m and &E design, there's gonna be more need for training of local folks um, on, in our case, data related um, issues and, and measurement and things like that. And, and you know, learning the appreciation for those things, um, not to mention just having the tools and the skill sets to, to deal with them. So, so local capacity building is, is actually pretty important for the longevity of, of, of programs. Um, being flexible. So in essence, you know, we take time to put plans together, everybody does, um, but we've got to be doing that with the recognition that in a few months or a year, we got to throw it all away and could possibly start from scratch just because stuff that came up that we didn't expect. So, you know, we can't get too married and too emotionally attached, I guess, to our plans. Um, because we may have to let them go at some point. So we gotta be willing to change direction um, or just you know, maybe a few indicators or the emphasis on a few indicators over time. And then finally, um, this, and again, this maybe comes from, from my experience um, mainly in the private sector and management consulting, but you know, limit your insights to what the data says, because it's tempting when you're you know, a consultant or brought in as an advisor or something for people to start asking you questions. Um, and again, I don't know, I haven't seen it a lot in international development, but I know it can happen um, where they start asking us for our advice on what they should do, right? Well, we're not the experts in the technical areas necessarily or in sectors or different kinds of programs or countries even sometimes. You know, the people that work in them every single day and work with those things are the experts. So we, we need to be careful of, you know, understanding that our role is one, to be objective and two, to only look at the data and in our best, you know, give our best efforts to explain what that data is telling us and you know i guess what it should help help the practitioner interpret what that data is saying but not to help them make a decision and you know this may be a discussion point maybe somebody would have a different perspective on this one but um you know it just kind of gets can get us into trouble trying to believe that we're experts uh in a particular field um, when, when we're not, when, you know, we're, we're experts in the data and how to measure it, measure it and interpret it. But, um, you know, we don't know necessarily the best way to achieve an outcome, particular outcome. So that's it. I'm, I'm ready to open it up for discussion if there is any. Well, thank you, Tim. <clears throat> that was a, an excellent presentation. I know um, we had some questions come up in the <clears throat> sidebar. Hmm. Um, from Jan and from Jen and uh, from Sonia. From Sonia, yep. Okay. So, um, do we have any? And, and I think there were quite there were good ones about uh, qualitative data, um, and also about uh, local expertise in the Caribbean. <laughs> Sonia, are you able to perhaps provide your question? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, thanks very much for that. In my head, I'm a bit, um, yeah, concerned because I feel like I've heard a version of this from every funder, every think tank and every major consultancy in our sector for the last five years. But I don't know any organization that does this in practice and does it well. Could you possibly give us some examples, ideally in the Caribbean? Yeah. Wow, that's a good question. <laughs> um, and Alan and, um, and Valerie, please feel free to jump in. My 
my experience in the Caribbean is honestly fairly limited. Um, I can't tell you actually anybody that's doing it super well. I mean, there's, there's several organizations trying. I mean, I know like um, there's organizations like DAI who I know has like a, a pretty good data science. And again, we, my emphasis right now has been on um, a lot of the machine learning part of it. So the, the more sophisticated an, an analytics, but I know, you know, they're looking at ways to leverage that in, uh, in their operations. Um, Dexis is another one that I think is fair. And they actually had a big hand in this CLA framework in developing it for, for USAID. So I'm not surprised that they're sort of thinking in these ways too. Um, I think global communities, I know they have um, at least are th in some stage of thinking about data science and, and at least getting data in order. Because that's, that's the thing, every, every organization is in different stages. You can't, when it comes to data, um, you can't just skip steps, right? So for example, um, you may have a lot of data in house, but it's not in an accessible format. You know, like I said, you could have a bunch of Word documents in on one person's computer and some Excel files from something else on another person's computer, you know, in different parts of the world, there could be different definitions for the same metrics going on. You could have stuff on paper sitting on people's shelves. So, you know, in that case, your first priority is to gather all that data together and aggregate it in a way that, you know, in a, in a data warehouse or in a, a data lake or something where you can at least start to get your hands around what you have. So I think there's a, a good number of organizations that are in that in the recognition phase of that. Um, there's fewer ones who have actually started to undertake those kinds of programs, you know, invest money in it and budgets to and people to, to do that. Um, and then there's other ones that, you know, maybe they are trying to skip ahead. They're, they're thinking or just hiring it out, right? That maybe they'll, they have the data in a, you know, scattered about, but it's all digital. So they'll just hire somebody to come in and, um, and put that all together for them. So I don't know if that answered your question very well, but uh, it's kind of kind of what I've come across so far. Sonia, can, can I ask if um, you could give me, give us a little more um, background to the work that you've been involved in and maybe some of the impediments of uh, executing uh, data to impact because um, I think that's interesting and particularly in your work here in the uh, Caribbean. Um, thanks yeah and uh, no, thanks for your answer that kind of yeah that confirms sort of what I was thinking. Um, I must admit I've got to the Caribbean three months ago and you can hear from my accent I'm not from here. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think I joined CEI a week ago so here we are. Welcome. Um, <laughs> Thanks. But uh, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm looking for interesting work to do here. What I've spent the past couple of years is um, that, yeah, that whole journey of getting organizations from um, saying, oh, yes, data is really important to actually realizing what data they really need, in what format they need to collect it, having a, a solid system for that in place and then using it. Um, in the place I'm currently working, I've spent the last year building our own monitoring database. Um, so I've basically taught myself how to um, build no-code databases. We've developed that over the last year. The good thing is it now has information about pretty much everything we do, which I'm fairly proud of. And now the interesting thing is nobody minds. So we, <laughs> we used to have all of this data um, sitting, as you said, um, on people's computers and Word documents. So that's what we started out with. Mm -hmm. now, and we have it in a brilliantly um, used uh, online database that's accessible to everyone at all levels of the organization at all times and nobody uses it um, and that's sort of what we've been working on for the past couple of uh, months because even though we started out trying to ask people what they wanted and in what form they would need to see it at what times and so on we've gone through so many variations of what people thought they needed that then didn't turn out to be useful that yeah mm -hmm. it's interesting that that tends to be the case in most organizations that I've since talked to about this. I think the problem is basically um, the sort of normal one of innovate. You know, if Ford had his customers what they wanted, they would have said if it's a horse, not a car. Yep. And that's kind of the problem we're facing. So if you ask people, well, what information would be useful to you, but they've never had to do their job with that information because it doesn't exist at the moment, they're not going to tell you 
that information is that would really make them better at their job, right? So that's right. sort of what we're digging at the moment. Right. You could almost start maybe one layer up from that is like, what, what problems are you trying to solve? Like, you know, ask them maybe like what kind of decisions they make on a daily basis or have, you know, trouble making. Um, and so start it, you know, r relate it to maybe what they do on a daily basis. And then, yeah, maybe, you know, you'd have to come up with the data that would, you know, fulfill that. But, you know, it, it's a start at least maybe to get them thinking from their perspective. And then you can translate that into either an analytics issue or a data issue or something like that. I mean, have you found, have you, maybe you've tried that and that doesn't work either. I don't know. <laughs> No, uh, that's that's a good point. Yeah, that's what we are trying at the moment. Um, people aren't necessarily, um, yeah, that might be very sort of related to where I'm working, which is also heavily politically influenced. Um, mm. I really would love to hear from um, people that have been working in their organizations where people have been saying, yes, I'm interested in data. I want data to, uh, to be used in these and these and these decisions that I make where that's actually work is it for some reason there always seems to be a disconnect between what people say they want and need and what they then end up using in reality. Yeah. I think um, the, the, this um, is a fascinating discussion and over the summer in um, August, well it was summer and early fall, autumn, uh, so in um, August, September, October, uh, we're going to be hosting um, a number of panel discussions on the Evolve for Action, um, the Decade for Evaluation. Um, and actually one of the topics we're going to look at is the use of, of data um, and particularly some of the problems in the infrastructure for generating data or analyzing data and um, in interpreting data. So that's going to be one of the, the questions uh, that we'll have a panel discussion on. Um, and if anyone wants to be part of the, the CEI's wider commitment to that Evolve for Action agenda, um, Susan Brenker uh, Green, who's the director, has just put out a call for volunteers to kind of work with her subcommittee. Um, so for those of you who are new, like Sonia, uh, or more seasoned, um, then please look at that because I think there are important questions uh, that um, are raised for the local Caribbean uh, area in what Tim's presented and I hope that we'll give them a wider canvas in the coming months. Um, mindful of time, but there was an, also a very interesting question from Jen and I know Jan had a follow-up on that, and it was about digitizing qualitative data. So, Jen, could you perhaps just introduce your question by telling us a little bit about yourself and also your experience of digitizing qualitative data um, and using some of the uh, software like Atlas or in, in Vivo uh, and something a little, be little bit behind your concern? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I... Um, well, let's see, I've, I've been working on USAID um, monitoring and evaluation support programs since 2012. I'm currently the chief party on the Haiti Evaluation and Survey Services um, project. And um, so I'm very familiar with um, what was presented today, um, but I'm curious about about the qualitative element because I find that we, we mainly use um, qualitative um, methodologies in performance evaluation and we work under very tight time constraints on very tight budgets and so we just don't have either the time or the financial resources um, for um, using software. We just, we just don't. We tend to use um, kind of quick and dirty but yet rigorous and structured approaches to qualitative data analysis. Um, we call them tally sheets. It's basically an Excel file. And it's not dissimilar from, 
from what you can do with the software. It's just that the learning curve on the software, I think, is is steep and um, and it requires resources that we just don't have. Um, so I'm given that context. Um, I'm not, it's not clear to me what the. I mean, obviously we we do digitize the data in the sense that we type up all our notes because that's something that you say generally wants to have and speaking to the issue about the confidentiality before we submit any notes we do have to eliminate any um, PPI and, and we do do that um, so we do digitize them but I'm not but we don't you I'm not sure that we I mean, we do that just so that we can deliver the notes as a as deliverable to you, say. So I'm not sure what the advantages of digitizing it um, from a data analysis perspective. I'd like to hear more about that. I mean, I get it from the quantitative perspective, but the qualitative data, it's not clear to me. Are the reports you're talking about, I mean, is it in a standard format? So there's like specific questions and sections. And so every document is formatted like a template in the same way? Um, yeah, but of course, you know, the, the, the questions that are asked and the way that they get asked um, can vary across stakeholder groups. Mm. So, you know, obviously we want to collect information about um, the similar topics so that we can triangulate across stakeholder groups but depending on the stakeholder group the question might get framed slightly differently so i would say generally we are using a more semi-structured approach to our interview and focus group protocols than a structured approach so sort of broad topics maybe even some subtopics but the ways the what questions actually get framed can be somewhat slightly different but yeah they are the template there are templates for the notes they just aren't necessarily exactly the same across the different stakeholder groups okay well, that, that kind of brings up another question that i would have is do the, do the questions need to be different i mean are they generating the same kind of information just the questions are rephrased or could could the questions actually every stakeholder ask the question the same way I guess you potentially could, but since you're, since the objective is to sort of get different perspectives around the same topic, mm -hmm. it's sometimes useful. And then also because it's, you know, it's semi-structured, it's not structured, yep. um, you know, you can't necessarily predict that um, the team leaders and assistant team leaders or sector specialists will go into an interview and frame the question in an identical way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose we could tell them to do that, but that seems to me to kind of be a antithetical to <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. qualitative yeah. approaches. I mean, the yeah, whole point yeah, yeah. is to have some flexibility, right? Right, right. And I guess, it, and so, you, yeah, you, you don't need to be so specific about how the, the answers are phrased because I'll give you one example that I've heard of, of one of these um, international organizations doing is, so, you know, I think it's around proposals, you know, or bids when, they, when they're writing proposals for bids. Um, they went back and they scanned like all their different proposals, you know, for I don't know how many years back. And the, what they were trying to find out is what one, is there a way to um, make the, the proposal process faster, right? So are there similarities in how, um, bids were, were or proposals were created and filled out that um, could be automated so that it almost like pre-populates parts of of the of that um, process of that document um, and then the other would be you know are can you when you when you scan that data in that proposal you know you know which ones you won and which ones you lost so you could look at the ones that you won train a model to scan through you know, the text of all the, the other older proposals that you won, train it on that information so that you can, and it can extract the information that, you know, most correlated to, to you winning that, that bid. 
You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not an mm-hmm. expert in NLP and all that, but that, that's one um, way that, you know, I know every proposal, I'm sure, wasn't worded the exact same way, but at least it had maybe the same sections and the data was in the same rough location that a, that a computer could read it and say, okay, I see section three. So this information is going to be in section three. So that it can scan that text and extract it, you know, and then there's even like numbers, you know, even like dollar figures or staff numbers or whatever that it could, it could look for that particular information and put it in, put it into an Excel file or, or a CSV file or something. Right. And so you've got your, from that qualitative data, you're actually pulling out quantitative data. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, that's not dissimilar from what we do with our tally sheets. I just, our current prod, um, COR at you state really hates it when we quantify qualitative data. <laughs> what, what, do, what do they hate about it? They think it's inappropriate. Do they expand on that at all? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> okay. I mean, it, it, I mean it, it, this is sort of, I'm sure other people on this call have had similar experiences working with you, said, but you know, there's on the one hand, it's inappropriate to quantify qualitative data. On the other hand, where he wants to make sure that we're reporting facts. Um, so, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I understand. I mean, I guess the, the example that popped to mind, and I don't know if it's relevant for your case or not, but like, you know, I was um, working on a an ass- community assessment survey, you know, and, and it was not a survey, actually, it was um, interviews. I didn't actually perform the interviews, but I had the data, you know, I helped write the questions and I had the, the had them put all the responses in an Excel sheet, you know, and when you get that feedback, you know, you can categorize that kind of data. And so even though it's qualitative responses, I mean, if you read enough of those qualitative responses, they tend to fall into buckets, which you probably know, right? And so you can- Yeah, of course. Yeah. And and of course, if you're talking to a group of 12 people, as opposed to a thousand people, the survey, yeah, you can't say with statistical significance mm-hmm. that, you know, from these 12 people, this is, this is what we need to do. So I'm not saying that if that's what, you know, your, your person means by quantifying qualitative data, I, I would agree with that. But you can say, you know, among these folks, I think, you know, this, this number of them said, said this, or they've fallen. I mean, we had, I think it ended up being like 200, over 200 different people that were interviewed. So we had a pretty good sample size to, to work from, even with qualitative data and interviews that, you know, you can say with some confidence that, okay, you know, half of the responses or three quarters of the responses fell into this type of category. So that means something, you know, yes, we can't say it with statistical significance, but we don't really need to if, if, Three quarters of the people in this community, three quarters in this community, and three quarters in this community all say the same kind of response. That's to me, that's valuable. That's an insight that you know you can't. You don't just write a write the responses. You know what I mean? You you can tally those up. I see we've got um, Daniel's raised a hand, and we've got another question from Rohan, which might be a good one to end on. The, this has been a very interesting discussion between Jen and uh, and Tim about the role of qualitative data and the the breadth and depth of that. I come from a very quantitative background, um, and I think we need perhaps to maybe have a webinar on qualitative uh, data. So, Jen, if you um, wanted to think about that, please contact me. We're always looking for new ideas and new speakers and I think it's um, it's a very uh, interesting debate um, and one that you know we'd be happy to take forward um, so thank you for that um, I see Daniel Scott is hand raised um, I'm not sure Daniel yeah, if you want to make a comment yeah, so this is Daniel Sarp on USA I was thinking that it just to add another perspective to what Tim was saying the conversation that was going I think one aspect or one perspective that one can take in terms of digitizing qualitative data is because there's the power of use of language. And so sometimes 
you know, when we go through all of this, we may come up with the major themes and sub themes or domains that sort of speaks to the broader issue. However, the, the way things might be framed need to maybe be captured because it may be related to support or trust, which might fall in the main domain or the subdomain. But the way it might be phrased might lend itself, if in, indeed one is looking to formulate an intervention, they would need to look at how it has been framed. So I think capturing that uh, seems to be an important element because sometimes it could be lost if everything is grouped into the domains and subdomains and people have no at least examples or samples of what was said that fell into those uh, major and subdomains. Uh, so that was just a uh, comment. Thank you. Yeah, and, and it sounds like you were talking about the responses, you know, language use and responses, which I definitely agree. There's, you know, it, and this is where, you know, human learning comes into play better than probably computer learning, right? Because humans can best interpret that, you know, better than a machine can. But what I was also thinking of, back to my example from this community assessment is, you know, there's a training aspect involved with the enumerators too, because we started to notice, you know, with some groups that a particular enumerator was asked was working with, you know, their answers tended to be different than another one, you know, I mean, but they were consistent across the different groups that this one enumerator had done, but it was different than, than the other ones, you know what I mean? So there was, um, there's that aspect too, to your, to your language issue. So it's almost like a, a, there's a discipline and a training with the enumerators that needs to be um, followed too, right, to, to eliminate that. But again, the capturing, it, but, you know, had we not captured who was actually the enumerator asking the questions, we never would have known that, right? So to your point, kind of, it's almost like metadata, capturing the metadata too around um, the, the data itself can give you insight into qualitative data as well. Excellent. Um, and I know that in the sidebar, there's been some interesting discussion going on um, about capacity um, at the local level um, and thinking about monitoring and evaluation within the Caribbean region. This is obviously something that the, um, uh, the CEI is um, here to help address. So for those of you who have been commenting about capacity, um, uh, and about infrastructure, um, please contact me offline. As I say, Susan Branker Green is heading up the Eval for Action, and she and I are planning some panel discussions for August, September, October, um, and under the No Person Left Behind. And I think a lot of these uh, comments we'd want to uh, take on in that. Um, I think we've 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 really um, we're beyond time, but I, I think um, there was just one last question if Rohan is still here, um, and it was about the, the CLA approach to adaptive management and whether there's been any assessment. Rohan, do you want to give a little background to yourself and to your question? And that might be the one that we end on. Yeah, we wrap up on that one. Yeah, well, Okay, Alan, thanks. Uh, well, I am a, I'm a researcher and um, my research projects would span the gamut from, from business to social development. A uh, researcher with something like about 20, 25 plus years of uh, designing and uh, implementing projects as research solutions. That's what I would say about myself. Yeah, and um, I notice how very closely what is described as adaptive management, you know, sounds like agile um, project management. And um, it's a good thing because uh, this kind of approach to me would 
make what you're doing more responsive, you know, to the needs that would have guided the design of the project, but which would come up during the implementation, you know, just making what you're doing more responsive. So I like it. And I was I was just wondering, you know, USAID is ahead of the game in coming up with a formal approach or a structured approach to what this could be like. What is their experience, you know, in, in, in implementing it? How long have they been doing it? And whether they have had the time to assess its 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 results so far, you know. That that that's that's the idea in my head. So if you have a quick view on that, you know, I would take it. Um, yeah, it's a it's a broad question. Um, I would probably say, and I you know, I honestly can't tell you an overall um, you know assessment on how how it's been done, but you know, I'm probably guessing that it's been mixed, um, that it's been successful in some countries with some missions in some kind of sectors more than than others. Um, but you know, I think we have someone from USAID on the call, so maybe, maybe was it Daniel? Maybe he can jump in and say what he's heard. But um, you know, I know there's been a lot of emphasis on it and a lot of tools rolled out, and um, you know, I think they've had some success at least. But I, I don't know from a broad perspective. Well, thank you very much, everyone. I think this has been. Uh, this presentation, Tim, has stimulated perhaps the, 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 the biggest discussion that we've had. So thank you for being the catalyst for discussion and thank you everyone for your questions and comments. Um, we've run over time, uh, but I, I, I sense for all of us who've been on it, it's been a useful, um, uh, a useful time together. Um, just a heads up, next month's webinar is going to be on the um, 22nd of July and uh, at a slightly earlier time of 1 p.m. Eastern, uh, which I think is 12 noon Jamaican time. And we're delighted to welcome back um, our friend Dr. Nadini Perso, um, who's going to be talking about evaluating remotely. Um, and really, this is in response to the global pandemic where we've had to adopt a new normal in evaluation and she's been reflecting on that. Um, so that will be next month, July 22nd, 1 p.m. Eastern. We'll put a, a notice out about that, um, but I hope we have a similarly good turn uh, next month. But thank you, Tim, very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, on behalf of CEI and all of our guests. It was very interesting and I'm sure um, generate, will generate a lot more discussion on this topic. Great. And then just so everybody knows, I did put a message in the chat to Rowan because I didn't like my last, what I left him with was, I don't really know. Not a good way to end. But if you want to check the um, USAID Learning Lab, that's where they house all the information around the CLA framework and there's you know, case studies and tools and all sorts of things that may give you more insight into, you know, how, how well it's been, uh, how, how broadly it's been um, implemented and how well and, you know, things like that. So it's in the chat. Great. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. This will, this um, recording will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, maybe in, in in another week, and we will also we'll be sending out a, a survey um, for just to solicit some feedback. Okay, thank you all. Thank you.